Thank you. Um, so with apologies to people who are at the Tapudaha Matatini Whanau Day on Monday, the first three minutes, five minutes will be all that you've seen before. Um, so that picture will look familiar for one. Uh, but for most people who weren't there, uh, let me go over this. So uh, this is an emergency department or an A&E department in New Zealand, would be called. Uh, we have patients who are in beds and doctors and nurses that are treating them. Uh, we have a waiting room where people come in, they're triaged, which means they're assigned a priority, and they wait until a bed gets free. Usually that's the bottleneck is, is the bed. Once one's free, another one goes in, and again, they're chosen by priority, the, the most severe patients being seen first. And then some fraction will actually leave uh, without being seen because the wait was so long. Um, so the original motivation for this work that we were doing, it's, uh, it started quite a while ago when I was at Washington University in St. Louis. And one of the physicians at the hospital there who worked in the emergency department came to see me and said, we've got this problem of boarding where patients are in beds, they've been seen, we know what's wrong with them, they need to go to the main hospital, um, but there are no beds in the hospital. So instead, they're occupying beds in the emergency department. And what you might imagine is if they're occupying beds in the emergency department, then they're backing up the whole system. So what this physician wanted was a queuing model that would predict the effect of boarding on the patients that were leaving without being seen. Um, so, and because this was the US, that would then show lost revenue, and then they could actually use that, that lost revenue number to persuade the hospital administration to do something about getting patients out of the emergency department uh, and into the hospital faster, more efficiently, more beds in the hospital. Okay. Um, so we did that. We, bought, we built a queuing model uh, based on some fairly... Uh, a fair number of approximations in there, as you might imagine, because we've got priority queues here and we have people leaving without being seen. Uh, but what it else actually made us realize is we don't actually understand the behavior of patients who leave without being seen. So most of this talk is actually going to be talking about understanding the drivers behind patients leaving without being seen so that we can actually have a good model of this abandonment, this leaving without being seen, and with a good model of that piece, uh, if we have a good model of the other pieces, then we have a much better model for our decision making uh, in the emergency department. Um, and so, you know, this, one of the reasons this is a big problem, uh, particularly in the US, is there's increase in emergency department visits because if you don't have health insurance, the emergency department has to see you, whereas doctors don't. Um, and a decrease in emergency department capacity because some hospitals can't even afford to keep them open because of all these patients that don't have insurance. It's the US. So there's some uh, crisis. Um, and here's some lovely pictures of waiting rooms in the US um, <laughs> where you can now start to understand why people are leaving without being seen. Um, so do we know enough about patients' behavior? I would say we don't. And that's what one piece that we're trying to answer uh, in this work. Um, so up to 15% of patients in some hospitals leave without being seen. Uh, in our data, it was 7 to 8% of patients are leaving without being seen. So very significant numbers. Um, and of course, huge uh, health concerns. You know, basically, they probably come back. They probably were sick. Um, and as I mentioned, in the US, they care about revenue. Um, so related literature to this work, you know, we are related to the literature on abandonment. There has been a little bit of empirical work, and so most of what I'm presenting today is actually going to be empirical work. Um, and also in the emergency medicine literature, there's been some work. Um, so what, as I, as I just said, what I want to present is some empirical studies that we've been doing, just trying to understand that leaving without being seen behavior. Um, so we want to identify you know, the drivers of leaving without being seen. 
That leads to some managerial insights for how we can actually manage our emergency departments. We want to take a look at the hazard rate uh, of leaving without being seen to lead to sort of a discussion in terms of how would we actually model it and then broadening it out again if we want to model the ED, what do we actually do? Um, so, you know, we, because this is an empirical work, we're going to come up with some, some hypotheses. Most of these are not going to make you fall off your chair. Um, so the first one, which should be blindingly obvious, is that we would expect the leaving without being seen probability to increase in waiting time. And one thing I want to point out with some of these statistics is why are people leaving? Well, some of them have waited so long that they got better, but <laughs> there's actually quite a lot of patients that, that leave because they feel too ill to wait, right? And those are the ones you're really worrying about. They just feel so uncomfortable, so ill that they actually leave and maybe they can go find another doctor somewhere else, but maybe they just try again tomorrow and in that uh, their health outcomes are going to be significantly negatively affected by that leaving. Okay? Um, so yes, we would expect leave without being seen probability of increase in waiting time. We would also expect it to increase in ED crowding. So that's, the, that's how crowded the waiting room is. Uh, part of that comes to the psychology of queuing, basically the more anxiety I have, the, the less tolerable my weight. Um, and also we have seen some work in the medical literature that shows this as well. Uh, the last of what I'm calling a baseline hypothesis, in other words, what anyone who's familiar with queuing systems would actually hypothesize, is that we would expect the probability to decrease in observed service rate, right? So you're sitting there and you're watching all these people getting served, it's going to make you less likely to leave than if you were just sitting there and nobody seems to be, be going into the, into the waiting rooms. Um, so one thing for the people who are really paying attention, you might say, well, uh, if I know waiting time and I know service rate, don't I know queue length, Little's law? Um, yes, except that because we've got a priority queuing system, uh, what we're going to be looking at in terms of queue length, crowding, it's going to be the total number. What we're looking at is waiting within a class. Um, and so, you know, we did do some tests and we don't have to worry too much about collinearities. Um, so here's our, here's our hypothesis diagram with leave without being seen. Depends on wait time, crowding and service rate. But more interestingly, we also want to know, are there some interaction effects. Are there, is there an interaction between waiting time and crowding? Is there an interaction between waiting time and service rate? And in particular, uh, we would hypothesize that indeed there should be. So waiting time should depend on the observed service rate. And in particular, we would expect that if you're observing lower service rates, you'd be more likely to leave for the same waiting time. And for crowding the same thing, we would expect that if you've waited the same length of time, those who see a more crowded waiting room are probably more likely to leave. Um, so how are we going to examine these? As I said, we've got, this is an empirical piece of work, so we have all this data from the emergency department. We actually have more data than we're going to use in this study. We have the moment that the person walked in, in the moment they were triaged, the moment they got a bed, the length of time they were in a bed. Uh, we have all the number of tests that were done on them. Uh, but for this, basically, we'll actually just use when they arrived, when they departed. We'll do some control variables on their demographics and then their acuity. That's basically their priority for service. Okay, this was a urban adult only USMRED. Um, so there's some, con there's what we're going to control on gender, ethnicity, acuity, day of the week, and hour of the day, because there's obviously big non-stationarities in any emergency department. And most of our patients are acuity classes C and D. E are the people who really shouldn't be there because they just, you know, they didn't need to go to an emergency department because they, you know, whatever. They, um, but they probably don't have health insurance, they don't have a doctor to go see, so they went to the emergency department. Um, a are your resuscitation patients, so they won't leave without being seen, um, so they're not included in this. Is one male or 
Uh, that's a good, good. The yeah, the mean is biased. Um, I think I think we've got more women than, than no. I think we've got more men than women in this. Yes. Uh, what you will notice is that 68% are African American, um, because it's an urban U.S. emergency department. So that would also explain why we see more men. Uh, we've got more of the gunshot wounds, etc. Um, just being the U.S. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, so what are our operational variables that we're going to uh, look at? We're looking at the leave without being seen, did they or not, their waiting time, the crowding which we're going to measure upon arrival, and the service rate which we're going to measure over their uh, waiting time. Uh, now, in our data set, for about half our patients, we actually know when they left without being seen, which is great. So basically, in this emergency department, there was a nurse sitting close enough to the front door that about half the patients were kind enough to say they were leaving when they left. Half of them didn't. So half of them, we know how long they would have waited because we know when they were called. So what happens is the patient is called, if they're not there, they're called again after a little while and a third time, and if they're still not there after three calls, they're assumed to be gone. Well, the first timestamp of when they're called, uh, we know they've left before then, right? And not only that, for that data, we actually know how long they would have waited had they stayed, which is going to be useful. Um, so what we have to do for our, our patients when we know they leave, we have to estimate how long they would have waited had they stayed. Um, so yeah, so that's our, as I say, about half of them we know when they left, and about half of them we don't know when they left, but we know long, how long they would have waited. Um, so yeah, so for the ones that left and didn't get called, we have to estimate how long they would have waited. We actually tried two different ways. They both actually give the same result. That's not that important. Um, and, but why we need it is because we're going to feed in waiting time into our probit model. So we do a probit model uh, to try and estimate this, this, how this probability of leaving without being seen depends on waiting time, crowding, and service rate. If you looked at the person that went to the queue, into the same queue, assuming that they're actually the same acuity, the next person of that acuity, you maybe could have actually. That's an excellent, excellent way to think about it. Uh, don't know why that wouldn't work actually. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then we also, as I mentioned, we want to test for these interaction effects. So here's our probit model for testing for the interaction effects. Um, and these are just all our controls buried in there. Um, so here's the one that doesn't test for interaction effects, and uh, everything is significant. It's a good thing, in fact, highly significant. Um, so indeed, as you would expect, waiting time, you leave, more likely to leave. Crowding, you're more likely to leave. High service rate, you're less likely to leave. Um, and how, so what sort of effects are these? So remember the probability of leaving without being seen was 7 point something percent. Uh, that goes up to 11 percent if you're a type E patient and uh, the waiting time increases by one standard deviation. Okay, so those are absolute how much that 7 percent changes by. It goes up by 0.8, not 0.8 of 7 percent. Um, so, yeah, so then in one standard deviation increase in ED crowding, you can have a very significant effect. You've got about 15% of the people leaving without being seen again for type E. Um, and service rate, you'll see those changes are less significant as you might, not significant, less, less magnitude as you might expect. Crowd, yeah, yeah, crowding is how many people are in the waiting room when you arrive, and it's both your own priority and everybody else. So it's total number of people in the waiting room when you arrive. So here's our model with interaction effects. Um, again, we see significance, but more importantly, let's actually look at the marginal effects. So what we can see is as service rate um, 
goes, gets faster, the leave without being seen, uh, your, sorry, your probability of leaving without being seen, uh, given waiting times at its mean, so fixed waiting time at its mean, you're looking at the probability you're leaving without being seen, and indeed, as you would expect, it confirms H4, that's, you're more likely to wait when waiting rooms faster, even conditioned on um, waiting time. Okay, um, and that sort of flips it around. So now we're looking at service rate at its 10th, 50th, and 90th percentiles. Um, and looking at waiting time. So you'll see these graphs kind of separate in terms of sensitivity. Um, and over here, we're looking at the probability of leaving without being seen. And you'll see that our C and D patients kind of look the same in this case, which is not true in the more interesting case. Uh, which is looking at the effect of waiting time um, at different levels of ED crowding. So if our hypothesis was correct, uh, we would see this as a monotone curve. So we only get partial support. So basically we would see more crowding means you're more likely to leave for the same waiting time until some point, and then actually you're less likely to leave. Um, so what do we think is going on there? We think what's going on there is it's an expectations thing. So there's a fair bit of psychology literature that talks about how people actually make expectations in terms of weights based on information. So if you show up to a really crowded waiting room, you kind of know you're going to wait a long time anyway, right? So you're kind of expecting this long wait and therefore, because the wait is long, just like you expected, you're less likely to leave. Sort of interesting. Um, and also, we see a bit of a difference. Do you have any idea why there's crowding? Is there a selection effect that you would worry about? Some, some emergency rooms are more crowded than others. Yes. Which can correlate with all kinds of things in terms of health insurance. Yeah. Maybe it's really crowded because there's no alternative hospital within 100 miles, which would explain then I'm not going to leave. Right. Um, yeah. So in this case, there are other hospitals. Um, so we've only, it's only data from one particular hospital. hospital. Yeah, it's one hospital right. over time. Yeah. And there are some, I mean, there are some good hospitals that get very few patients leaving without being seen. You know, there's that, that's kind of the ideal is if you can actually prevent patients leave without being seen. So it's really a resource, you know, and, and how variable is your demand, you know, somewhat the demographics of your patients, uh, what other choices do they have, right? Can they actually go somewhere else? Um, you know, did they drive there? That sort of thing. So yes, there's all those, all those things influence the, the decision to leave without being seen. Um, no, but it doesn't change, it doesn't have dramatic changes. You tend to see these, once they're crowded, they kind of stay crowded for a while. And it's crowded when you arrive, and then yeah. it gets ten times more crowded. Yeah. Before it was bad, but it was, it's better for you because you got the, all Right. Things. Well, it may be, unless you're low acuity, in which case they'll be ahead of you in yeah. the queue, and it could get quite complex to think through those. Um, so the other thing is, for this case, we actually see a difference between type C and D. So D had lower priority than, than C. Um, and if we see the actual probability, so these, these graphs are on the same thing. So if we look at the actual probability of leaving without being seen, and what, what are my colored curves? They occur at different crowding levels. So this is for crowding at its 95th percentile. You'll see that C is much more likely initially but then D has this quite sharp <coughs> curve as waiting time gets longer. Right? Um, so your C has kind of formed their expectations more than, the more than your D, which again might speak to what you were just saying, Dion, right? It's sort of, you see all these people, yeah. So, and you know, it's sort of interesting the different shapes on these depending on, so this is crowding is very little Right? So when crowding, when there's almost nobody in the room, you're not very sensitive, not very sensitive until waits get very long, and then it's like, oh, 
what are they doing? I'm never going, you know, <laughs> they, they must all be out to lunch because nobody's, nobody's here and I'm still not getting served, right? So what gets, the most serious yeah, because they have not, this was back to the because they feel too ill to wait, right? They've come, there's this hugely crowded crowded waiting room, and they're just like, oh, I can't stand this. Oh. You know, <laughs> it's not good, right? <laughs> um, so so what, can we, what can we pull out of this in terms of managing the emergency department? Um, so initially, it increases in waiting time, but then as it gets congested, the sensitivity decreases, which means um, you need to set expectations uh, right so people kind of can, can judge. But on the other hand, there's also you don't really want the visual cues associated with, with an overcrowded waiting room. Uh, and so as far as we can see, this reduction in crowding is the first order effect. That's kind of what you want. But the sensitivity to wait sensitivity to crowding, I should say, uh, is a second order effect that needs to be considered. And there's some very interesting research being done right now uh, by uh, someone I know, but not someone I'm working with, that is actually trying putting up estimated waiting times in the emergency department and just seeing what effect just predicted waiting times actually have on people's leaving without being seen. Right? Are they more likely to leave, less likely to leave? You can kind of argue it both ways. Um, you want to, you obviously want pretty good estimates of those waiting times. Yes? Yes, yeah, so people are, yeah, so it's all, there's a lot of noise in this, right? Because you don't actually know, I mean, most of us are not doctors. When we walk in, we don't really know. Well, first of all, we don't even know we're a C or a D. They don't tell you that, right? They don't say, oh, we've diagnosed you as a C. Um, and then diagnosing what the other people there are there for. I mean, you can get some sense of who's really urgent, but I think it's hard to tell who's ahead of you in the, in the queue, which is why we just used that total crowding as our um, statistic we looked at, because we, you know, we think it would be hard for you to actually figure out exactly who's here and what acuity they are and things, even though in some sense it makes a difference, right? You're going to be doing some estimation of, oh, they look fine, they're not going <laughs> to... Oh, how much waiting time? That's true. So they're just, I think they're just doing aggregate numbers though, right? Because again, you're not telling people are you a C or a D. So they're just putting up screens. And I think, again, it's not my work. So I think all the screens are doing is saying average weights of, that people have experienced rather than any sort of predictive models. So I think it's just, you know, <coughs> here's, here's the waiting times. Um, so again, you don't know if that's going to make people wait or longer, or more likely to wait or not. Um, they're also trying, so they've got quite a nice controlled experiment though. So they have the, the screens blank for some of their days. They have the screens showing something entertaining for other of the days. And then they have these statistics on waiting times for the third, third one. So it'll be very interesting to see you know, what actually affects. Because there's all this psychology of queuing that also says that if people are entertained, they're more likely to wait. So that's why they have mirrors outside of elevators, um, because it makes the wait seem less long, because people are busy looking in the mirrors. Um, <laughs> there was also an airport that had all these complaints about the baggage taking too long. And uh, what they did was they moved the baggage claim further away from the gates, and the complaints went away. <laughs> So, so all of these things are, are important, particularly in the sort of psychological things, which are hard to model, but they are actually important to understand from a, from a system design standpoint, especially in an emergency department setting where you're actually talking about people's lives, right? Um, so yeah, so this idea that these observe, higher observed service rates, they do encourage them to wait, so giving patients a sense of progress is a good idea. Uncomfortable. Yes. 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 Is there any way to disentangle that? 
not with our data, but I think it would be important to disentangle because I think you're right that those are actually two effects that are both important. And the, the discomfort effect has got to be fairly significant, I think. Um, Just from experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially this is, an, this is adult only, but you can imagine some waiting rooms you've got screaming kids and, yeah. Yeah. In terms of function, I mean, it seems. If they've got people waiting and some people leaving, they'd rather have the less urgent people being waiting. Yes, and that's and that's not necessarily what's happening, right? It's those no. it's those I mean the the ease who we don't have a huge amount of data set, they, they have fairly high leave without being seen rates. But this, this it could be just that they want to adjust the queuing as well as the what how they inform people, right? So Well they do give C's higher priority, so in but theory. Maybe they're not giving them high enough priority. High enough. Yeah, but then they've got their B's and their A's, right? So, yeah. yeah. I mean, they just need more resources, ideally. <laughs> and less boarding, which is where all this started, right? If they can get those people out of their beds that are supposed to be in the main hospital, they can move people into beds, um, which, it, you know, that was the original motivation of, of the study was, you know, what effect is that boarding having on these patients leaving without being seen? So what's the nature of the priority? Is it absolutely? Yes, it is, which is another interesting, another interesting question. You more priority than the Ds. You're already giving them as much priority as possible. Yeah. You yeah. don't take any Ds until you've Cs. Cs. Yeah. 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 But then informing them differentially makes sense, right? Yeah. So, I mean, right. And, and yeah. Smart, yeah. Like, here's you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe they've got you sort of in space of waiting for that. It's a steady flow of higher priority. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, except it's non-stationary, so eventually you do calm down and things, but, yeah. Yeah, no, some of the weights, I don't know if you saw the data, I didn't really point it out. <laughs> um, the mean waiting time is, is 97 minutes, but there are weights in that data set of a day. <laughs> I think that was the extreme, but yes. <laughs> so some of these weights are very long. Um, so so that's that's kind of some insights in terms of in terms of modeling this, in terms of what we can do managing this. But in terms of modeling, a lot of our queuing models do actually just assume there's a distribution on how long you're going to wait and then you leave. So we can we can look at some hazard rates uh, for our different acuity classes there. I wouldn't spend too much worrying about some of these bumps in terms of the data gets pretty thin out there. Um, so, so this is basically your likelihood of leaving as waiting time increases. And the first thing you'll notice is it's not flat. So unfortunately, assuming an exponential time until people leave, as most of our models do, is not great. It's really not even close. Um, the, the, I'm, I'm not going to put too much significance to this kind of up and down, but it is actually consistent with some other work that's looked at abandonment from a server system, not an ED. Um, and they also saw this unimodal up and then down in terms of kind of once you've sunk that much time in it, somehow you become less likely to leave. Um, and that's somewhat the story we saw. Who are just going to wait? Yeah, and actually, we just tried to test for that, and nothing showed up in terms of. I mean, that was my original hypothesis: is we've got two types of people here: the people who are just going to wait forever, and then the people who are um, who are not. And we did try to tease that out, and we couldn't see it. But doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's one of our control variables in terms of the original model. But yes. Uh, in terms of the hazard rates, we haven't. Actually, they look pretty similar. We did the, the, with the control variables and without, and they look pretty similar. Um, so, you know, so how are we actually going to model this leaving without being uh, seen? Um, well, if we can only choose one, then actually you're better off choosing crowding than waiting time. So, actually, if you build your model based on crowding, it's going to be slightly more accurate is what the data would say, than if you build it based on, on just waiting time. Um, it's not necessarily monotone. Um, 
and there we see this varying sensitivity. So that's all going to be a little hard to model, unless, of course, you go to simulation. So if you go, a lot of decisions in emergency departments are made via simulation. What I would point out is we can now use our... Um, <laughs> you can come out this way, it's okay. Um, you can, we can now use our empirical model to plug into a simulation, right? So, so you're simulating your patients in your emergency department, the patient gets called, at that time you know their observed wait time, you might have to kind of estimate the service rate that they observed, because that's keeping all that data is going to be a little hard. Um, and you know the crowding when they arrived. So we could just plug that into our empirical equation and get a probability of them leaving. Then in the simulation, you do a coin flip. And if it's one, then you route them to exit. And if it's two, you route them to a bed. Um, the only disadvantage is you're going to overestimate the number in your waiting room, because you're not taking them out of the waiting room until they get called. But other than that, that should be a fairly good model of leaving without being seen, right? Um, so, yeah, so that, that's one, so that's if you want to simulate it. So I think, it, I think what this work has shown is if you want to simulate your emergency department, I'm pretty comfortable with this as a way to do it. If you want a queuing model, uh, which of course queuing models have advantages because they're explicit, I think um, if you have to use a patient's distribution, Weibull seems promising. And notice you could actually parameterize that based on crowding levels. So people who arrive to an uncrowded waiting room could have one dis distribution, and people who arrive to another one could have another one. Um, and as I just mentioned, it looks like predicting leaving without being seen based on Crowding is slightly more accurate than waiting time. Well, that's actually good news because uh, there's an approach for queuing systems. So this is a Poisson arrivals, general service, multiple servers, uh, finite waiting room, and abandonment um, that uses the number of customers in queue. So what WIT's approach does is he, ta is he estimates these abandonment rates depending on number of queue from the original patient's abandonment time distribution, right? So he's assuming in this model there's some general distribution until people leave. Well, you don't have to assume that. You could just use the rates at which people leave for the different number of customers directly from the data. So basically, if you've got this many customers behind you, those are your rates of leaving. Um, and there has been some work, uh, unpublished undergraduate thesis, however, um, to adapt it for priority queuing systems. So there's an open problem, as you could actually see if this works. Um, but I think if you're going to, this would be sort of, if, if you're going to do a queuing model approach, this would be the way to go, is to basically just assume that people leave based on numbers and then adapt it, adapt this work, make sure it actually works. Um, one of the things, the problems with using a queuing model is, of course, it's not stationary, but people who do this stuff, queuing models in emergency departments, usually assume it's stationary enough within an hour or whatever your period is, and then approximate it that way. Um, so in addition to the offered waiting time, wait, the abandonment does depend on these other factors. Um, I've already talked that through. And we kind of know how now how to simulate leaving without being seen, and therefore we can simulate our emergency department. Queuing models will might be a bit challenging if we only take one variable. I think there's real potential there for how to do it. Um, and that, that's just the piece on leaving without being seen. What are we actually going to do about the entire ED? There's also open questions there. Uh, one of them, easily solved with simulation, really hard in queuing is we actually have competing resources. We've got nurses, beds, doctors, all of which you need to actually get your service time, right? That's hard. Priority service always throws a wrinkle into it. Um, basically, their priority is absolute, but it's not clear to me that's how they should be doing it. Um, and I don't know if you've seen Ilza, who's here in Auckland, present, but she also has been thinking a bit about uh, can we actually wait the time that you've waited with some priority and, and have a better policy. Um, and other people have shown that service rate depends on workload, 
right? So most queuing models will assume that service rate is just from a general distribution, but actually it's not. Doctors are people, and uh, they work differently depending on, on the backlog. Um, so it would be good to have effective models of that. Um, and of course, the thing is, these are actually life and death decisions, right? Which also makes this very interesting work because, you know, here you could actually save lives if you do it well enough. Um, so there's huge amounts of work to do, I would say, within, with modeling these, these emergency departments. Okay. That's it.